Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me for uh, this presentation of the remote workforce. Uh, I think it can be a very powerful competitive advantage. As a matter of fact, I know it can be a very powerful com uh, competitive advantage uh, for people who use it uh, and structure their culture so that they can take advantage of it. Uh, obviously, right now with this tidal wave of, uh, you know, uh, coronavirus, uh, making everybody work from home, it's a new concept for uh, quite a few people. Uh, I've been doing this for 25 years. Uh, I started back in the uh, in the 90s when I was with IBM. Uh, I actually worked from home once as an engineer, obviously, but you know with a 56k modem, uh, didn't need much back then, and they didn't let us do it very often. That was like you know once in a, every two months type of deal, you know, waiting on a package or someone to service you know your your air conditioning. But these days, it's it's uh, technology has enabled us to really take advantage of this. Uh, ability to work from home. Um, so COVID-19 is spreading. Uh, we need to maintain social distance. Technology is allowing us to work together. Uh, you know, so what, what does it take uh, to really take advantage of this? Um, let's talk about that in a minute. Uh, when you have a culture of mutual trust, respect, uh, clear and simple strategy and outcome-based work. It doesn't matter if the workforce is co-located or not. They're going to get stuff done. Uh, they kind of know the playbook. They know what's expected of them. They know the output that's expected of them on, on a daily, weekly basis. Uh, and they just, they just work. Um, so give me a second here. All right. So this is what most people think is going on right now with their employees working from home. Uh, I don't think it is, but you know, it's, it's a fair, uh, it's a fair concern. And if you don't have the right kind of culture, you may be right. You know, your fears right now, uh, lost productivity, lower profitability because of this productivity, uh, you feel like you're losing control of your employees. Uh, if they're not there in the office and you can't keep an eye on them, you know, you might feel like you're being taken advantage of, uh, you know, maybe they're only working two or three hours a day and, and making it look like they're working more. Um, these might be valid fears if you have a very uh, unstructured, um, bad culture, you know, it, it, it just might be the way it is. So quick agenda. Um, let me do a quick introduction of myself. So I'll let you know who I am, where I come from. Uh, some of the current questions I've seen uh, in the past week. Um, and then I want to go into, you know, a deep dive on, you know, leadership that makes or breaks uh, a culture that allows people to work from anywhere. Doesn't matter if it's on-site or off-site, you know, remote. Cover some of the advantages of working from home and remote and uh, some of the obstacles, uh, you know, advice for, for leadership and, and frontline workers. So at me, I've lived in 10 states so far. Uh, you know, I'm not finished traveling yet. Uh, my sons uh, are, are young. They're, they're 9 and 11. So it keeps me in Atlanta right now. Uh, once I go to college, I will probably move. <laughs> uh, I love to fly airplanes, uh, go camp at Oshkosh every year, still listen to vinyl. So as technical as I am, I still believe that vinyl sounds better than CD, audio. And I yes, I have 24, 192 and everything else, but I still think vinyl sounds better in most cases. Uh, ride motorcycles, uh, run, and went to University of Maryland, love crabs. Uh, my history, I was with IBM for a decade and a half, and the whole time I was in Atlanta um, uh, for, for that whole time period. I uh, worked for various divisions within IBM uh, when it was initially just IBM, and it was an IBM, uh, oh, what was the name of that? They, they spun us off and then brought us back in again. It was global services for a while. Uh, I helped co-found IBM's Lawson practice, uh, so we had consultants working, you know, all over the United States and, and eventually uh, France and a few other places. Uh, worked on the Atlanta Olympics for a couple of years. I uh, wrote the initial indoor volleyball, and then I ran beach volleyball during the Olympics. That was a blast. And uh, my favorite part uh, was working with the IBM software group uh, the last uh, three years I was there. So I was in product marketing created some programs for IBM Partner World. Uh, at that whole time, you know, my group in IBM, uh, they were headquartered in Somers, New York, 
and I worked with people from Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, California, uh, a couple of places in California, actually, uh, Amsterdam, uh, you know, you know, we we're all over the place. None of us, it was funny. We'd show up at a trade show and be like, oh, so that's what you look like, right? Um, since leaving IBM, I've worked for several startups uh, and consulting. I've done work for uh, the Air Force, uh, mapping, uh, home automation, industrial automation. So what I talk about now are forces that, uh, you know, want to drive you into oblivion. Uh, there's this physics concept called uh, entropy, and it just means that it's, you know, it, things are constantly moving and, uh, you know, moving apart, settling down, moving in different directions. So I try to help uh, companies understand the forces, uh, external and internal, that are working on them. Right now, obviously, coronavirus is uh, an external uh, force that's operating on the culture of all these different companies, uh, and there's going to be some changes. Uh, so how can you harness those changes uh, for your net benefit? Uh, internal and external forces can be anything. External could be government legislation comes along. Uh, right now, they've ordered everybody to you know stay home until the end of March, and that may get extended into April and May. Uh, you know, the economic climate, that's certainly going to change. Uh, the Dow's been dropping like crazy. Political forces, uh, technology-driven business models, that's outside of this discussion, but, you know, why not? Someone comes up with a new way to collaborate. Uh, technology is always advancing. Internal forces, you know, you've got talent. Uh, they're learning. They're growing. Uh, you have talent coming in. You have talent going out. Uh, your leadership. Uh, needs to be able to work in a crisis management situation. They need to learn new skills. Uh, you may need new processes. Uh, processes that worked yesterday aren't the processes that are going to work tomorrow. Uh, on this slide, I've got more question mark. That means uh, you give me some more. You need to think through these forces. You know, what are what are all these little forces that uh, apply to your business to to knock you off kilter that you constantly have to you know look for. Technology is growing at an exponential level. Um, you know, it's not like it was 20 years ago where, you know, this year you've got something, next year you got to worry about something else. This is like this month you have to worry about something, next month you have to worry about something else. It's changing quickly. So, and I deal with transformative business models. Uh, you know, let's look at more personalized product or service. What does technology allow us to do now? Uh, how can we change our processes now that we have access to these new technologies? But most important to this discussion, a more collaborative ecosystem and an agile and adaptive organization. This has to change and right now is a perfect time to talk about this because when you have a remote workforce, uh, you'll be able to see in real time uh, you know, how agile and adaptive your organization is. Uh, and it's very important to have an organization that supports this. So, what are some of the advantages? I mean, obviously, it saves commute time. Uh, I love working from home. It saves me at least, you know, I'm in Atlanta. It saves me at least two hours a day, if not more. Uh, you know, that, that's time that I can use either for myself or, you know, to work on something for work, presentations. It saves energy costs. I mean, think of how many gallons of gas, uh, you know, we'd, we'd save if, if most of us worked from home. It'd be interesting to see in a couple of weeks the statistics on how much uh, gas consumption has gone down. Uh, this week and you know, these, these next few weeks. Um, even energy within the buildings, you know, assuming they close the buildings down, if they leave them open, you know, that's not really much of an energy savings. But, you know, if it's a, if it's a repeatable, consistent, long-term thing, sure, uh, it's going to save energy. There's less distractions at home. Uh, there's a great work. Uh, Cal Newport put out a great book called uh, Deep Deep Work. And uh, you need less distractions sometimes to really think uh, through, you know, and, and, and I'm assuming here that most of the people watching this uh, are, are in some sort of uh, thought based kind of work, uh, you know, a white collar type of work. Um, obviously, blue collar is going to be a lot more difficult. Although, to be honest with you, I guess you could bring, you know, tools and equipment home and work from your garage, although you may have liability. But anyway, let's ignore that for now. Let's just consider this to be office type work. Um, 
as a, as a owner uh, or, you know, the uh, sea level, you have less office space to worry about potentially. You have happy employees. But the biggest, biggest advantage is you can have access to a worldwide talent pool that if you require everybody to be geolocated, you're cutting yourself off from the whole rest of the world. And there's some great talent out there that works remotely. Some of the disadvantages, communications, uh, you know, obviously, if you've got two people on a whiteboard, uh, you know, or they're, or they're talking to each other, you know, in a, in a, in a room, they can read body language, uh, they can draw on the whiteboard, you know, the, the communications, you know, a little more powerful. Technology sort of, uh, you know, close that gap a bit. Security, you know, obviously, if you have people working from home, you have to worry about, you know, VPNs, you have to worry about, uh, you know, people uh, tapping into your network remotely. Um, uh, you know, security just in the fact of, you know, if you're pulling presentations around with USBs and one of your kids runs off with one of the USBs, you know, what what goes on then? You know, do you, do you lose, uh, you know, critical information that, you know, may, you don't want to get out there? Accountability, you know, I have a proposal in this presentation uh, that should handle the accountability, but if you're uh, of the type of organization that doesn't have a culture set up to handle remote work, uh, you know, accountability might actually be an issue uh, as well as productivity. And then, you know, from an employee standpoint, uh, you know, loneliness. I can remember one time I didn't leave my house for three weeks when I worked for IBM. Uh, I had a store across the street. Uh, there was just no need to leave. And after three weeks, I realized, you know, I haven't been out to see my friends or anything. You know, this is kind of, uh, and I'm an introvert, so that kind of comes naturally to me. But uh, everybody needs a little bit of socializing every once in a while. This is probably not the best way to work remotely. Uh, it is good to raise your son, uh, daughter, whatever, you know, uh, <laughs> a loving environment. Show them what daddy does every once in a while. But for the most part, you need to create a safe environment. Um, you know, and, and this is what a good, you know, remote work environment should look like. Uh, you know, I do this all the time. I mean, obviously, I'm doing it right now through Join Me. People use Zoom, go to meeting. There are a lot of different types of meeting software. Uh, but you can see people. You can see their facial reactions. Uh, a lot of these have whiteboards. I've got another slide uh, later in this uh, presentation to show you that. And, well, actually, here it is right now. So, you know, someone mentioned uh, the sixth principle of Agile Manifesto, uh, the Cockburn Ambor Communications Graph. Uh, and what that basically says is the top of the graph, you know, face-to-face -face at a whiteboard is going to be your most powerful conversation, followed by face-to-face. -face. Um, it's really, you know, th that was in 2003, 2005. Uh, you know, the, I've got a screenshot here on the left uh, of uh, Lotus Same Time, which is what we used in IBM uh, the last two years I was there, which was the early 2000s. And we had this ability to do chat. Um, we didn't use the webcams too often because, uh, you know, with the spread out, uh, the telecom network just wasn't there at the time. <laughs> and uh, you could even share your applications. So if you wanted to jointly work on, uh, you know, a, a Lotus um uh, presentation, uh, you could actually hand your keyboard over and let someone else make changes, which was great. We were in marketing, and sometimes, you know, you're, you're trying to say a sentence a particular way, and you say it, and it's great, and then you forgot what you said, and someone else remembers but says it's better, and you're like, here, just drive. You, you, you make the changes. We could do that in 2003, but like I said, you know, working over, you know, 56K modems, eventually 128, 256K, uh, it was still slow, but we have the bandwidth now. We have the tools. Uh, on the right, uh, there's an IntelliJ uh, session going on. So this is an extreme programming type of session. And, uh, you know, pretend that I'm a programmer. I'm working with the other programmer on the screen. Uh, we're both sharing a whiteboard. We can both see files. Uh, and I've actually given him control of my development environment. And he's making code changes uh, on my machine. And I can do the same for him if he can, you know, convert that back over. So um, technology is it's here now. So we just have to have a culture that takes advantage of it. So let me review real quickly uh, some of the keys to successful change if you're an organization that needs to change. 
uh, change your processes, change your culture. Uh, you need to have a clear picture of what you want the future to look like. Uh, you need a simple strategic plan. Uh, David Knorr, one of my cohorts, uh, laughs when he talks about this example of a CEO he called on, large organization. They had a strategic plan that was like 45 PowerPoint pages long. And it's like, you know, you get to page three and you're just like, exactly what is the strategy now? It should be one page. And uh, sometimes you need a little more, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, and, and I'll share with you in a minute a, a way of getting, you know, through that. Uh, but you need strong executive sponsors. Uh, this needs to be a top-down leadership mentality uh, built into your culture. Uh, it can't just be something that the CEO preaches down to his direct reports, who preaches it down to the direct, their direct reports, and then the frontline managers are like, you know, yeah, you're okay if you do this. You know, I might not do it that way, but you know, you're 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 okay to work from home. I'm going to work from the office. That's like, no, that's not going to work. Um, you have to have an organization that's ready for change. So your leadership basically has to be ready for change because if they change, everybody else will follow. Uh, if they still want to work there and you want people that work there, right? Um, you have to be willing to look at the structures, the processes, uh, and understand the magnitude of the change. Some may be small changes. Um, some may be larger. You might have like an immediate effect that has subsequent much larger effects. And so you need to sort of think through that. Uh, Think of the ripple effects that go through change, uh, you know, skill sets, impact on jobs. You might need new technologies. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about technology in this because, you know, everybody knows about the technology. You need a VPN set up. You need sufficient bandwidth at home. Uh, there's nothing really to say there. It's the organization that matters. So you've got these old habits that you have to change. So you have to look at your core values. You know, how do you provide value to your customer uh, in all the different ways? So your customer pays you money for a service, uh, for goods, uh, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, they, they, they pay for a value. You provide that value in various ways, uh, you know, initially through your sales organization until they sell a product or a service. Uh, you support them through your help desk, uh, you know, through new products. If you have a subscription, they're getting new features to products all the time. Uh, each one of these provides value to keep that revenue stream alive. And you need to understand uh, how your core values support that environment, uh, how it supports internally, externally. Uh, are you keeping your, ha you know, employees happy? Because if you don't have happy employees, you're not going to have happy customers, uh, and that that's a value. It's not an, it's not it's not an extrinsic value. It's it's a, it's a core value that's uh, you know very real, and it will affect you in lower revenues if it if it's broken. Uh, so you have to think through these things. The CEO has to set the right tone, uh, confident. You know, in this crisis management especially, uh, I almost used the picture of the CEO of Delta. Ed just presents this, you know, solid, grounded, you know, everything's going to be all right persona. Uh, instead, I found this guy. He's pretty close. I like him. Uh, but, you know, you got to set the right tone. You have to be confident. Um, you have to have a growth mindset. Now, growth mindset is very different from a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is someone who thinks that uh, – you know, if people haven't done something before, uh, you know, they're not going to be able to do it in the future. You know, they're, they're pretty much made out of the womb to do something or they have a natural ability to do something. And uh, to get them to stretch outside of their comfort zone, it's just not worth it. That's a fixed mindset. That is not a good mindset to have in our current environment, our current economy. Uh, your business will not survive with a fixed mindset. A growth mindset is what you want. That means that someone has the right attitude. And even if they don't have the right attitude, if given the chance, they might be able to develop the right attitude through positive self-talk, uh, through putting the right uh, uh, incentives in place, giving them the right environment. You know, obviously these have limits and you don't want to go too far if they're just not, you know, rescuable or they're not a right fit. But, you know, if you give some 
if you give me somebody with the right attitude and the right skills and maybe against someone who may have done it five times before, I'll take the uh, person who's got the right attitude every single time. Uh, you never know. I mean, maybe the person who's done it five times, they're resting on their laurels now. Uh, you know, you don't want that because then they're not, uh, they're going to keep thinking, okay, it's happened this way five times. It's going to happen this way the sixth time. It might not. Um, a growth mindset is, is, is something that, you know, you have to have an environment of trust. People need to trust each other. If, uh, if, if you can't be allowed to fail or try something and find out that, you know, something else works better, uh, you need that kind of environment. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to find new ways of doing things. Uh, if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, entropy will set in. We talked about that earlier. Uh, and it will start eating away, and other competitors will pass you up. Customers will get bored with your offerings, and uh, you know your, your, your workforce will just start kind of falling apart. They won't have new processes. You know, they, they need that environment. And um, everybody's in this together, no ego. Uh, one of the beautiful things I loved about working in the IBM software group is I'd get on a conference call with a couple hundred people and uh, you'd have engineers on the call, architects, uh, you know, consultants, uh, you know, first line managers all the way up through the VP of a division, which, you know, God, IBM, that's like seven layers of management. Uh, hopefully yours isn't like that, but that's the way it was. Uh, but it was an awesome environment. I, I watched an engineer, long-term engineer, uh, you know, after a VP had gotten through setting out like a plan, say, that's not going to work. And, and here's, here's why. And we listened and he laid out a good case to say why it wouldn't work. And the VP was like, man, that's, uh, that's a really good, you know, input. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and then he gave direction to a couple of other managers to go, you know, huddle and figure it out and bring it back at the next meeting. But there's no ego. A lot of companies would be like, you know, how could you dare call out a VP on a, on a call? Um, everybody needs to be able to share their opinion because sometimes people have great, you know, ideas and opinions. So once CEO has set the tone, uh, you know, it, and, and that's a cultural kind of message. Your leadership team needs to have, like I said, a simple strategic plan. Uh, strong leadership, meaning that they all back each other up. You know, they, they overlap. Uh, you know, they're all sort of the same person who's, you know, morphed into whatever they need to do to lead their part of the organization. Um, you know, it's a results-based culture. Um, might not matter how you get something done, it's the result that you get done, the result towards that value that you provide to your customer. Uh, if you need to, you know, reduce defects, uh, you know, reduce them by when. You know, we have this goal to reduce by, you know, a certain date. These are the people who are involved. This is what we expect of each one of those to, you know, reduce the defects or, the sales team needs to increase sales, so product management needs to come up with new products and new features to enable that. Uh, you know, we need them by this date. Everyone agrees that, you know, it's a, it's a doable schedule, even if it might be a little compressed. Uh, you know, it's based on results. It, clear organizational goals, and the managers lead by example. So what I mean by lead by example is, you know, if you expect your uh, employees to be productive at home, you're working from home. You're struggling through the same thing they're struggling through and you're identifying with them. Um, you know, you roll up your sleeve, your support uh, of your employees, of your front line, um, and even the executive managers is the same way for their leaders. Uh, everyone has to lead by, you know, an example. So one of the things I mentioned earlier, and how do you create like a simple strategy? Uh, I'll just go ahead and throw this in there, uh, you know, through, through the NOR group. Uh, you know, I, I work with a couple of people. Uh, Len Wilson is an artist, phenomenal artist. And, uh, you know, David or I, uh, you know, or a couple of other people in the group uh, can lead you through a strategy session and say, you know, what, what do you do? What's the value you provide your customer? How do you do that? How are your employees involved? Uh, what kind of processes are in place? Uh, you know, and we can start to sort of draw. Uh, out, you know, what, what that would look like. 
you know, so in this example, you know, you can see that we've drawn, uh, you know, one sort of uh, presentation. For this particular customer, there were actually five different concepts, and the customer, you know, picked this one. So then we, after we've come up with that, we refine it into uh, graphics, uh, that, you know, very nice and professional graphics, and, you know, one page that you can show your employees and say, this is our mission, this is our goal, this is how everything fits together to provide value to that customer. And in this particular case, you know, their, their main value proposition to the customers is we provide exceptional customer experiences. Um, so we can provide that, that's, that's one great way. Another great way is through storytelling. Uh, your whole leadership team should have like a good basic grasp at storytelling. Uh, I can teach that. Uh, we have other cohorts that can teach that. Uh, uh, it, it's a very powerful thing to be able to tell stories uh, to illustrate your point. People remember stories. They don't remember, you know, bullet points. Um, you know, frontline managers are active coaches. Uh, you know, they, they understand how everybody in their group contributes to their organizational goals. You know, they go through it as a group. They might go through it individually. Uh, they set clear expectations and ground rules. Uh, you know, some of those might be, you know, you're working from home. If, if, if someone calls you, uh, you have to return the call either immediately, within 15 minutes, you know, whatever. Uh, chat, you know, I don't know. It depends. If you're, if you're in a group, uh, you know, say you're in a marketing group and it's part of your culture to throw ideas off of each other on a, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, you might want to have some rule set that, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, you need to respond to a chat within 15 minutes. You know, don't get too far from your computer because someone may need your help to bounce some ideas off of. But if you're a programmer and you've been given a piece of code, uh, you know, to work on, you know, maybe chat is something that, you know, a couple of hours, you know, who knows? Uh, you need to give that person time to like be completely in their little bubble to think through the complexities of whatever it is they're trying to, to do. So if it's super urgent, you don't send a chat when you could pick up the phone and make a phone call, right? So, you know, think through how you want to communicate, how you want to collaborate. You don't want to be onerous because you're output based. You have specific goals and outputs that you want to achieve, like, you know, maybe on a daily basis, but maybe every two days. Uh, maybe you have two items that need to add up to, you know, one other thing by Friday. Uh, if they miss one, but they get the other one and they make Friday deadline, that's fine. Um, what you don't want to do is say, okay, I didn't see my employee on at 8 a.m., and, uh, you know, they, they weren't on at 5 p.m. You know, it's like they're punching a time clock. You can't do that with remote employees. You're not going to save them very long, and you're not going to get the best cream of the crop people to work for you uh, in that kind of environment. Nobody wants to feel like they're punching a time clock, you know. An exception to that would be your help desk. Uh, Apple has a great setup where you call in for support. Uh, you use the menu to kind of figure out where what kind of help you need. And then it routes it to somebody who's working from home. I've worked with several of these Apple, you know, technical support people. And it's obvious they're working from home. Uh, but they have the tools they need, the technologies they need. They have a laptop. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're talking to you. And Apple, I'm sure, has some sort of navigation mechanism. You know, when you call in and you have this problem, they probably notify 15 people at the same time. Uh, and whoever's sitting next to their computer that responds first is the one that's going to get my call. I don't experience it at all. It's seamless to me. It seems like they're right there, Johnny, on the spot. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's how you set up the technology to support work at home, and that's what Apple has done. They can use people from all over the globe, especially since they run a 24-hour business, right? Their help desk is always the same number, same process, but depending on where you call in, the software is going to distribute it out to, you know, whatever language you need, whatever time zone you're in, uh, seamless. That type of organization for that group, the, you know, the manager would say that, you know, you're, you're never more than, you know, 30 seconds away from your, you know, or you're expected to be at your desk from, you know, two hour time slots, uh, you know, from nine until 11, then you get like a, a break and then you can come back, you know, 
or it could just be, you know, you're paid per ticket. You know, I don't know. You need to think through these processes. You need to think of, about the people who are working remotely and what makes the most sense to get the most output from them and have them be happy. Uh, happy employees or productive employees, uh, people who think they're constantly being micromanaged and under the gun are going to give you exactly what you asked for and no more. Um, so let's talk about how technology, you know, the people do this, you know, in, in agile, uh, you know, they, they have several processes, uh, you know, they, they have product backlog, they do sprint uh, planning, then they have a sprint backlog, and then they have, you know, certain time periods that they uh, use to set this up. Uh, and that equals uh, what they call a scrum. So, you know, scrum is uh, the end result of all this, uh, you know, this, this whole process. So let me break it down from a technology standpoint, because that might be easy for some people to understand. But let's say that you have, um, you know, three features that you want to uh, get out to the public, uh, you know, in the next two weeks. So you get everybody in a room, uh, all the programmers in the room, product managers in a room, uh, you know, and the Scrum Master, and you say, okay, this one out of three features, uh, you know, how can we break this down into component parts? And let's say the team says, you know, you could do this as the minimum viable uh, product. Uh, and then, you know, these other three things you could, uh, you know, uh, after that has been promoted and tested, then you can do these other two or three things that, you know, don't have dependencies on each other. The first one should take uh, an average experienced programmer three units. Uh, and a unit might be hours, it might be uh, half days, uh, you know, it's, it's whatever the team determines uh, that an average person could do in a reasonable amount of time. Um, then you take all these different components and you've got them ranked. And so perhaps you give uh, an experienced or medium person that first bucket of work that needs to be done so that the rest of it works. Uh, you know, you're reducing risk by giving that, you know, a, a more experienced person that, that job. Uh, then you give uh, maybe some of the more junior people some of the other items, and you know that it's going to take them a little bit longer. Uh, so if an average person takes like a day to create that output, maybe it'll take, uh, you know, an inexperienced person, uh, you know, a day and a half, two days. Uh, and you have this mapped out ahead of time. So when I say units, earlier, let's just say that, uh, you know, uh, one unit would take an average person one day, it would take an experienced person, you know, half a day, it would take a beginner uh, two and a half days. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's work that comes through all the time that you know, that's where it kind of more or less falls out. We can go into deeper detail on this. Uh, let me know, email me. I've got my email at the end of this if you want more of a deep dive just on that process. Uh, anyway, everybody has input on that. So it's not a manager telling one person, I need this back in one day. That's the critical part to get out of this. Um, you have a mutual relationship with everybody in the group that does that type of work that something that's coming along, this is about how much time it takes this type of person to do. That way, it's not a manager guessing uh, and then putting stretch goals in place for somebody who's, who's taking on some work. Because if you say, I need this back by Friday at noon, and you're new, and everybody knows that it takes an experienced person, uh, you know, uh, a week to do that, and you're only given three days, uh, you know, that, that, it just doesn't work. And that's an extreme example. I know that won't happen, but it happens all the time. Managers are like, you know, I need to give these people stretch goals to make sure that they're working. I want to get my eight hours of work out of them. You know, you need to let them work the way they need to work. Sometimes they can get that work done in four hours uh, just because they, you know, their energy level hits the right spot. They got enough sleep. They had a moment of inspiration. The next week, they might take that exact same person twice as long to do that, but it's still within the time frame that they're allocated. Uh, you know, that, that's the way you have to work this. 
Does that make sense? That's how you set goals based on breaking this stuff down. And you feed that back up to, you know, the higher level goals. Leadership can do that. You know, say, well, you know, we got this down, we broke it down, we realized it was going to take a little bit longer, or it's not going to take as long. You know, th this is the core stuff you have to sit down and work out for your organization. Uh, you know, what those processes are, how you're going to handle that. It works excellent for marketing. It works excellent for product management, obviously, for engineering. Uh, you know, it, it can work for several areas in your company. And these days, you know, lean startup, uh, agility, it matters more than ever. Uh, you know, you've got collaboration, obviously, when you, you know, when you get to the organization stage. Uh, you know, there's a whole process uh, that, you know, I can go through just based on product management. You know, you have a concept. Uh, you bring it out to everybody else. They, they pick it apart. It passes to the next step. It might become, you know, more of a more of a, 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 con, a you know a phase where you start developing something. Uh, you know, you collaborate on it, uh, and you go through these processes where you iterate, uh, you learn, uh, did it work or not? If it didn't, let's go back again and iterate. Uh, when you have these processes in place, uh, everybody kind of knows what to do. It's like a basketball team. Uh, you know, they, you never know what the play is going to unfold, but everybody has a core set of skills. They know how their teammates are going to work. They have certain processes that they're going to go through, certain plays that they know that when the ball comes from this direction, gets to this person, you know, they're going to run this set of plays. Uh, that's what you need for a remote workforce, because when that works well, it doesn't matter if they're in the office, working together, or they're working from a thousand miles away. It works. You have a process. They know how to play off of each other. So basically, on the one side, you've got a short term thinking. You're not going to keep talent around. Talent's really scarce. If you have a fixed mindset and you're, you're micromanaging them on a clock, that's not going to work. There's going to be an adjustment period where you might need to use a little bit of that making sure that, you know, they're staying engaged uh, because, you know, for them, it's a new environment as well. Uh, so maybe for a couple of weeks, you know, you need to sort of crack the whip a little bit, but then you need to start, you know, letting off some slack, letting these people get what their accomplishments are, coaching them. You know, if they don't make the first you know, one or two, uh, you know, outputs, find out how bad they missed, you know, listen to them, talk to them about, you know, well, what could they have done better? Uh, you know, how can we make this a better process in the future? You know, is it a matter of you getting a better space? Uh, you know, find out what they need and help them. Because if you have engaged employees and a growth mindset, you've, you're able to tap talent from around the globe. Uh, that's a major strategic advantage over the long term. So some of the closing tips and comments. Uh, I don't have much here yet, uh, uh, you know, introverts versus extroverts. I, I want to build that list out because I know that they're different work environments and everybody's going to be different. You know, I mean, I'm not, uh, I don't want to lock people in with Marge Briggs because I think they can be anything they want to be. Uh, and and I, I don't like it when people type themselves too heavily because it's just a preference exam. But Myers Briggs, you know, they've got 16 personality types. Uh, and, you know, you sort of self-identify with the type, and that's fine. Um, introverts, you know, I, I work in a certain way. An extrovert is going to work in a completely different way. Uh, you know, th think of someone who's in technology versus someone who's in sales. You know, you've got that. Um, introverts, don't stay quiet. Make an effort to uh, participate. Um, people will... You know, you, you'll become lost in the noise, and then all of a sudden, three weeks down the road, people will be like, where's Jim? I haven't heard from Jim. You think he's actually working? You know, what's he doing? You don't want that to happen. The extroverts, um, you know, they're, they're going to have less of that problem, but, you know, they're going to have a, a bigger problem feeling lonely uh, when they're working from home. So, you know, I've heard recommendations like, you know, keep background mu music playing, uh, it just sort of, uh, you know, it, it makes you feel closer to other people. Uh, you know, I don't know if there's like a webcam of, you know, the the airport that you can watch people moving around. I don't know if that'll help. I'm not an extrovert, so I don't know. But <laughs> uh, don't cavitate. 
Um, that is the one thing that drives me nuts. Um, I used to see it in IBM, you know, quite a bit because you'd get like a new team together and everybody wants to make sure that everybody's being productive. You know, here, I'm being productive. I'm being productive. And they're just throwing stuff out there. It's just noise. You know, you, you can't get through the noise to actually get to anything useful. Uh, so don't cavitate. Uh, don't, don't be busy just to be busy. Uh, and, and that's that fixed mindset. That's what generates that. When, you're, when you've got people on the clock and you expect them to work eight hours and be there exactly, and, you know, they're, they're going to just throw stuff at you just to let you know that they're being busy because you're pressuring them to make sure that they're busy. But if you don't give them output, specific output, they are not going to um, know what output to give you. So they're just going to give you everything. Uh, that's not very for productive for anybody, you or them. Um, get a good quality webcam. You know, I'm using a Logitech HD 1080p. Uh, you know, it's a great camera. I've had it for a couple of years, and, uh, you know, I think they've uh, gotten pretty good these days. Uh, get a good microphone. Uh, you know, I've, I've got an audio, sorry, AKG uh, microphone with a Shure preamp. Uh, I've also got a headset microphone if I need that. Uh, sometimes if there's noise around, I don't know, sometimes they blow the leaves and stuff like that. Uh, you know, maybe I need a headset and a microphone that's, you know, very close to keep all the noise out. You know, just get prepared for that. Um, don't worry about getting dressed for work. I know some people say, oh, you should get like, you know, get out, shower, uh, dress just like you're going for work. Um, you know, do this, do that, all these physical things. Don't worry about that. Um, I can tell you in the years that I've been working remotely. I mean, maybe it's nice for a couple of weeks to sort of get in the mood, but, you know, I've done more teleconferences, uh, you know, with my bunny rabbit slippers on than I care to admit. <laughs> you know, put on a shirt, make sure you shave, but, you know, you don't know what I'm wearing underneath this. I might be wearing pajamas for all you know. Uh, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, just, just be focused on the output. And, you know, it's up to your leadership to tell you what the output is. Uh, and, you know, if you don't have to teleconference with anybody for a whole day because you're working on, you know, some very deep thought thing, whatever makes you comfortable. Go take a nap if you need to. You know, if it helps, do it. Um, just make sure you get your output done when it's expected. And it's very important for everybody to build trust uh, on both sides. Um, you know, it, if if someone's going to go off and listen to music all day and not do work, it's going to show up eventually. Uh, and you're not going to last long at that company. And if they've got a great culture, that's going to be your loss. Um, you know, same for the managers, same for leadership. Uh, you know, be be kind to your people. Uh, make them enjoy it. Support them. Uh, that's it. Um, any comments? Uh, suggestions, content you'd like to see covered more, uh, email me, uh, mark at travis-company.com. Uh, and if you'd like me to come in and help you, you know, with your organization, you know, I'm feel free. I can do it remotely too. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Uh, I've done it several times before. So uh, thanks and uh, have a great day.